This is the second lecture in a series of lectures on Introduction to Exterior Differential Systems. In this lecture we'll be thinking about surface theory. Why are we thinking about surface theory? Where are we going? We want to construct examples of exterior differential systems. And what could be simpler than to construct the lowest dimensional examples that we can come up with? So among the lowest dimensions we can find are the surfaces in three-dimensional space. So we'll look for equations on surfaces in three-dimensional Euclidean space. In particular, we'll look for differential equations for those surfaces, which are invariant under rigid motion of three-dimensional Euclidean space, so that they really represent geometric features of those surfaces. The problem we first run into is that there really aren't any differential forms which are invariant under all rigid motions. Here, rigid motion means isometry, in other words, uh, distance-preserving maps under the usual metric of three-dimensional Euclidean space, the, the usual Euclidean metric. And there just aren't any non-constant differential forms. There are the constant functions. Otherwise, there aren't any differential forms that are invariant to rigid motion. So what do we do to construct these systems? In principle, you could try to look for exterior differential systems that don't consist of invariant forms, but that are still invariant systems. But we won't head in that direction it would be more useful for us to think instead about trying to actually construct invariant forms somewhere else. Instead of constructing them on three-dimensional Euclidean space, we'll look for invariant differential forms on the frame bundle of Euclidean space. So I'll try to explain what the frame bundle is and then try to construct its invariant differential forms. In these lectures, E3 means R3, in other words, a space parameterized by three variables, with its usual metric, its Euclidean or Pythagorean metric. We also want to be careful with notation. The letters, the symbols E1, E2, and E3 will be used to denote any orthonormal basis of Euclidean space, not necessarily the standard basis. In using this Notation E1, E2, and E3 for any orthonormal basis, we're following Cartan, and so we sort of can't really escape doing this, although it's certainly not standard use in mathematics. A frame. Since we want to build a frame bundle, we better say what a frame is. It's made out of frames. A frame is a pair X and E. X is a point of Euclidean three-dimensional space, and E is a triple of vectors E1, E2, and E3 an orthonormal basis of, e, of, of Euclidean space. But there are a column vectors, E1, E2, and E3. We'll think of them as column vectors, and they're arranged into the columns of a matrix called E. We can see a picture of a frame. It consists of a point and then three vectors, which form an orthonormal basis coming out of that point. But remember, again, that E1, E2, and E3 don't have to be a particular orthonormal basis. Any orthonormal basis can occur in a frame. The frame bundle of Euclidean space is a set of all frames. So we've we denote uh, Euclidean space as E3 and the frame bundle as E3 with a little bit of a picture frame in the upper left corner. Um, we, we note that, of course, E3 is a three-dimensional manifold, trivially, but it's not so trivial that the frame bundle is a six-dimensional manifold. And that's because we have a point x and, uh, and, and, and a frame e, e1, e2, and e3, x can move around in three-dimensional space. It has three dimensions worth of motion. And then we can rotate around the three coordinate axes, our, our frame, uh, e1, e2, and e3. And so we get six dimensions. So um, any rigid motion of e3 takes frames to frames. And of course, by rigid motion, I mean an isometry. And on the other hand, any two frames of Euclidean space are identified by a unique rigid motion. And these two observations make it possible to treat rigid motions and frames as being essentially the same objects. Once you pick one frame, it differs from any other frame by a unique rigid motion. A frame uh, is adapted to a surface if the point x of the frame lies on the surface and the vector e3 is normal to the surface. So E1 and E2 will then be tangent to the surface at x. So when I say normal to the surface, of course I mean normal at the point x.
So there's a picture of what a frame looks like adapted to a surface with the E3 vector being the vertical vector in that picture. The frame bundle of a surface is the set of all of its adapted frames. And again, we use a similar notation with a little picture frame corner to indicate the frame bundle. The frame bundle is a three-dimensional manifold. Why is that? Because we can move the point, little x, along the surface, giving us two dimensions of motion for the point. But then we have to worry about the frame. We can rotate the legs E1 and E2 around E3, and that will determine wh exactly what frame we're, we're dealing with up to some plus and minus signs for E1, E2, and E3. And so you can see that there are three dimensions of a worth of, of parameters to describe a point of the, of the frame bundle of a surface. Of course, you'd have to be a bit more careful to prove all this rigorously. We want to try and construct forms on the frame bundle, not just of a, of a surface, but the frame bundle of three-dimensional Euclidean space itself, so this six-dimensional frame bundle. There's a map on that frame bundle, an, an almost obvious map. You just take a, a, a point x and a, and a frame e, and then you map it to just the point x. You forget the, the, the legs e1, e2, and e3, and remember only the point. We'll write that map as x. Think about that map as being a map that associates to an abstract six-dimensional manifold, the frame bundle. It uh, maps it to a three-dimensional Euclidean space, which is a vector space, and so it's a vector-valued map on the frame bundle. Frame bundle is a six-dimensional manifold, and it maps into a three-dimensional vector space by this map x. Because it's a vector-valued map, we can write its exterior derivative as dx. You can think of that as a vector valued one form whose entries down its column are dx1, dx2, and dx3. And we'll define now one forms, not vector valued, but scalar valued one forms on the frame bundle, again on this six dimensional frame bundle manifold, we define these one forms which are omega i as ei dot dx. And right away, you should see that that's defined as a differential form on the frame bundle. It's not defined down on ordinary three-dimensional Euclidean space. On our three-dimensional Euclidean space, we only have a choice of a point x. We don't have a choice of, capital, of, of vectors e1, e2, e3. The vectors e1, e2, e3 are uh, elements of some frame, and we have to pick a frame to, to get them. So. Once we have a point of the frame bundle, we have a choice of frame, E1, E2, E3, and so we can define this object on the frame bundle. So the omega i's are defined the frame bundle, but they're not defined down on Euclidean space. How do we calculate them on the frame bundle? Each omega i at a point, x, e, when given a vector to plug into it, a vector x dot and e dot, it eats that vector and spits out a number. What number does it give us? It takes the x dot part of the velocity vector and considers its dot product with ei. So it measures the ei component of x dot. If we imagine that we had a moving frame, that is to say we move a point around in three-dimensional three space, so x of t is a moving point in three-dimensional space, e of t is a rotating frame, continuously rotating or smoothly rotating around, over time t. These omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3 are along that curve in the frame bundle are going to measure the velocity of a moving point, the x dot, as measured in the frame e of t. Because it like, calculated each time t a value for x dot, it takes a dot product with each of e1 of t, e2 of t, e3 of t, to give us those three different numbers. So in other words, the, the soldering forms measured the velocity of a moving point but as measured, not in the standard frame of Euclidean space, but as, an, as measured in a moving frame. Now we also want to measure not just how the point moves in the moving frame, but how the frame moves in the moving frame. So we want to measure the tendency of each leg of the frame to rotate towards each other leg. So we'll measure the tendency of the EJ leg to, to rotate toward the EI leg. And the way we do that is to simply take its dot product, ei dot dej. That gives us an op object which is defined as a one form on the frame bundle. Again, it's not defined in any way on, on Euclidean space, um, uh, the, the E3 Euclidean space. 
it's only defined on the frame bundle because on the frame bundle we have well-defined EIs, which we can think of as functions taking the abstract six-dimensional manifold frame bundle to the uh, concrete three-dimensional Euclidean space. Each of E1, E2, and E3 really is a vector-valued function, and so it has a differential, a DE1, DE2, DE3. And we can take the dot products of those with E1, E2, E3, taking the dot product in the sense of having an ordinary vector EI dot with a one form of valued in vectors, DEJ. So it's the output vector of DEJ that is dot product with the EI. And we should point out, maybe just to be careful, that gamma IJ isn't the components of a one form. It is a one form. For example, gamma 1, 2 is a one form. It's not written as in components. This isn't like a physicist notation where you might say a one form is given by some expression with some components. This is actually a one form in that gamma 1, 2 is E1 dot DE2, and that's a one form. For a moving frame x of t, e of t, we can say that because it moves in such a way that it always stays orthonormal, that the E1 and E2 and E3 vectors are always orthonormal, that means therefore that EI dot EJ must be constant, either always 0 or always 1, depending on whether I is not equal to J or equal to J. Because of the orthonormality, those are, those are constant. Then, then we can take the differentials of those dot products and get immediately that the gamma IJs and the gamma JIs are just negative to one another. Gamma IJ is anti-symmetric in I and J. It is, however, a one form. It's not a two form, even though it has those two indices which, in which it's anti-symmetric. It's a one form. And so we can, can put all those gamma IJs into a single matrix of one forms called gamma, and it will be anti-symmetric. These gamma IJ one forms are the levi civita connection one forms. And so we've constructed the soldering forms, the omega i's, and the levi civita connection forms, the gamma ij's. We want to calculate the exterior derivatives of the omegas and the gammas. Uh, maybe the easiest way to do that is rather than writing the omega i, we just write omega for e dot dx, by which we can say that we mean omega i is e i dot dx, but we just drop the i. But you could also think of it as being, in fact, a vector valued one form. It's a one form that's valued in a vector whose entries are omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3. Similarly, we write gamma as e dot de, by which we could say that we mean gamma ij as ei dot dej. Or we could say that gamma is the matrix-valued one form whose entries are the various gamma ij's. And so we can calculate that matrix by taking the matrix e and multiplying its transpose by the matrix de. And that's what the dot product means, after all. It means multiply the transpose of the left with the vector on the right. So in that sense, gamma is E dot D. Now you can take exterior derivative directly on, on both sides of those equations. You just take exterior derivative on each of the equations, omega is E dot dx and gamma is E dot de. And forgetting all the indices, you can immediately calculate out that d omega is minus gamma wedge omega, and d gamma is minus gamma wedge gamma. These two equations are called the structure equations of Euclidean space. Why are they so important? Why does Carton put so much emphasis on them? The reason is that uh, at this point we now have omegas defined and gammas defined, so we can define constant coefficient combinations of wedge products of omegas and gammas to make some kind of, of algebra. Because we now also have a rule for taking exterior derivatives of omegas and gammas, we can think of it as a constant coefficient differential algebra over the real numbers. We could take any wedge products with constant coefficients of omegas and gammas, and using these two equations, we can then take their exterior derivatives. So that's what's really important here, the ability to take exterior derivatives. I won't prove, but it is true that omega and gamma are invariant under rigid motions. In fact, if you go back to their definitions, it's not hard to convince yourself that that's almost automatic. They have a sort of geometric meaning, and therefore they must have uh, invariance under, under uh, geometric transformations. And once we have these structure equations, we can make use of these things in, in calculating with exterior differential systems, as we'll see. I want to apply this to a single example, the example of triply orthogonal webs. So I'll say what those are, 
and then we'll try to see if we can prove that they exist using exterior differential systems. And at crucial points, we'll need the structure equations of Euclidean space. Here's a picture of a triply orthogonal web. We can get a good idea of what it looks like, um, hopefully. Uh, so we, we have in this picture only really two foliations by, by surfaces, um, but uh, there's a, there'll be a third one understood. First of all, what is a uh, foliation? And that's something I don't want to give a precise definition to. Again, as always, all the precise definitions are in the lecture notes. But the rough intuitive idea is that a foliation of an open set of Euclidean space is a choice of a collection of a slicing up into surfaces so that each point lies on a single surface and the surfaces vary smoothly. So you have a smooth family of surfaces, which one of which goes through each point in some open set in Euclidean space. Um, so that's what a foliation is. In this picture, there are two foliations. You can see the leaves of one foliation intersecting orthogonally the leaves of the other foliation. If you look carefully, there are just two of them. There's, there are two families of surfaces, one of which hits the other one at right angles everywhere. So that consists of two foliations, and they're everywhere perpendicular to one another. Each leaf of one foliation strikes at a 90 degree angle, each leaf of the other foliation. So that would be a doubly orthogonal web. The picture is really just doubly orthogonal, but it becomes triply orthogonal when you recognize that in fact there's a third family you can easily draw. If you make the vertical axis there, if we were to draw it, you could then take all the vertical planes that contain that vertical axis, and then they would uh, each be everywhere perpendicular to both of the surfaces in that foliation at every point, in those two foliations at every point. So you can construct a third foliation. And so you'd get three foliations, each of which uh, is perpendicular to the other two, wherever any of their leaves meet. So that's the idea of a triply orthogonal web. Three families of surfaces so that none of the surfaces from one family intersect one another, but the surfaces from one family intersect those of the other two families, always at right angles. We want to prove that triply orthogonal webs exist, and they locally depend on three functions of two variables of initial data. Now the fact that they exist is not that surprising. If you just take the horizontal planes, the vertical planes containing the um, the uh, the directions along par uh, parallel to the to the y-axis, and then those parallel to the x-axis, you get, of course, the the parallels of the various coordinate hyperplanes, and they obviously form a triply orthogonal web. So it's not surprising that there's a triply orthogonal web out there. The really exciting bit is how, how much they depend on, how much initial data. They locally depend on three functions of two variables of initial data. That's the bit that's not obvious. I'm not sure that it would be uh, very straightforward to come up with that as a, even as a guess for how much generality you can construct these things with. I should point out though at the same time that this is a local result. In other words, we're not going to construct triply orthogonal webs in all of three-dimensional space. Even the example, the picture we just gave, really only defines an example away from a certain ver from the vertical axis. But in, 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 in general, these things might be defined only in some very small open sets. The theorem doesn't say how small the open sets were, turn out to be. As you sort of move out in space along your triply orthogonal web, you may find it develops singularities at some point. And uh, we have no control over that. So this theorem is a local theorem. And the carton kähler theorem is a local theorem. It doesn't give rise to global conclusions. And also, it only gives rise to conclusions in the real analytic category. Maybe it turns out that if you allow, say, C3 foliations instead of analytic ones, maybe you end up with a much larger collection of possible initial data. It's not obvious in this situation, but at least it enables us to calculate this with fair ease. So the cartan kähler theorem makes it straightforward to find these, that these things exist and to find the three functions of two variables. Let's see how that's done. This is a typical way in which we're going to go about proving things in all these lectures using the cartan kähler theorem. We'll start by supposing we have a solution, just one, but one presumably fairly general one. We want triply orthogonal webs, we'll assume we have one. We're going to then prove that it solves an exterior differential system in some way. Out of it, we construct an integral manifold of some exterior differential system. Then, 
once we're done, we're going to go backwards and show that if you have an integral manifold of that exterior differential system, it will at least locally give you back the object, the geometric object you want, in this case, a triply orthogonal web. So we start with a triply orthogonal web. We need to use it to construct an integral manifold of some exterior differential system, and then we have to go backwards and show that they're at least locally the same thing. Now, let's take the set of frames which are perpendicular to the leaves. So each foliation slices up space according to some leaves, and a triply orthogonal uh, web has three foliations. So at each point, there are three leaves, and they're perpendicular to one another. And so we just take E1, E2, and E3 to be any orthonormal frame which, which, for which E1 is perpendicular to the leaves of the first foliation, E2 to the second, and E3 to the third. There, of course, will be then at each point eight possible choices of E1, E2, and E3. E1 is only defined up to sine because it's got to be normal to the leaf, but there are two possible normals. So we get eight uh, different choices of, of frame at each point. But that's okay. Those sets of That set of frames, which has eight frames at each point, forms a three-manifold because you can move around the points around the open set in Euclidean space where the triply orthogonal web is defined. So we start in some, in some open set in Euclidean space, we move around in it, and at each point of it we draw these possible frames, eight possibilities, and then figure out what point they correspond to in the frame bundle, what eight points. That means they have an eightfold cover, uh, the X is an eightfold cover of an open set in Euclidean space where our triply orthogonal web is defined. Now let's take a look at the leaves. We said that we'll pick E1, E2, and E3 to be perpendicular to leaf 1, leaf 2, and leaf 3 from foliation 1, foliation 2, and foliation 3. Um, so it means that we can we can uh, look uh, in the small and see what that looks like. We have this E1, which is perpendicular to leaf number 1. Now we can smoothly pick out that E1 in some open set. We can think of it as actually being locally, at least given by some analytic vector field. So um, so we can then write it as uh, as, as giving a, a, a form omega 1. And omega 1 will vanish on the leaf. Why is that? Because omega 1 is e1 dot dx. As the variable x moves along the surface, dx moves uh, as a tangent vector to that surface. e1 is normal to the leaf 1 surface, and so e1 is normal to its tangent vectors, and so e1 dot dx is 0. That's exactly saying omega 1 is 0 on leaf 1. Omega 2 is 0 on leaf 2, and omega 3 is 0 on leaf 3. And that's true for all the leaves of the three foliations. Now, if omega 1 is 0 on leaf 1, then d omega 1 is also 0 on leaf 1. When you take exterior derivative, it takes 0 to 0. And so if the omega 1 form vanishes on leaf 1, then its exterior derivative d omega 1 also vanishes on leaf 1. And that's true on each of the leaves. On leaf i, omega i is 0, and so d omega i is 0. Now we have to be a bit careful about this, so omega 1 is a 1 form, uh, d omega 1 is a 2 form. And we're saying that where omega 1 is 0, d omega 1 is also 0. I leave you to check the linear algebra that that uh, can be re-expressed by saying that d omega 1 is a multiple of omega 1. d omega 2 is a multiple of omega 2. d omega 3 is a multiple of omega 3. Because d omega i vanishes where omega i vanishes from some linear algebra, you can show it's a multiple. When I say multiple, I mean a multiple in the, in the algebra of exterior differential forms. So it's a differential form multiple. And that means that its wedge product with it is, is 0. Omega 1 wedge d omega 1 is 0, not just along a leaf, but in, in the whole open set around that leaf in Euclidean space. So in other words, on the manifold x, the three-dimensional manifold, we'll find that omega 1 wedge d omega 1 vanishes. d omega 1 is a multiple of omega 1, so it's exactly that their wedge product vanishes. And so uh, omega 2 will be... Uh, uh, will divide into d omega 2, and so their wedge product will vanish. Omega 3 divides into d omega 3, so their wedge product vanishes. And so this capital X 3-manifold sits inside the frame bundle as an 8 to 1 cover of an open set of Euclidean space, and it's an integral manifold of this exterior differential system given by three 3-forms. Three
omega 1 wedge d omega 1, omega 2 wedge d omega 2, omega 3 wedge d omega 3. Now, if, if that's all I knew, I wouldn't be able to use exterior differential systems to solve this because I wouldn't know what is d omega 1, what does it actually look like? In order to use exterior differential systems, we have to calculate out polar equations. In order to calculate out polar equations, we have to know the linear algebra involved in these expressions of these differential forms. I have to be able to write them quite explicitly to be able to compute out the linear algebra, to compute out the polars. Uh, the problem with this, then, is that I need to know what is d omega 1 quite explicitly, and the same for d omega 2 and the same for d omega 3. And that's where I need structure equations. So you can see the importance of the structure equations in trying to carry out the, the calculations in exterior differential systems. You don't get to calculate anything unless you know how to actually find exterior derivatives of the forms that you're working with. So in this case, we can do that because we know the d omegas are certain multiples of gammas which omegas. And we can go back to our structure equations and plug them in. At this point, I want to get lazy and let you do all the work. I'll let you check the the structure equations, see how to plug them in here, and then calculate out the polars, all the polar equations. So I'll let you plug in the structure equations and check the linear algebra. I'll let you find that the integral elements have some expression, something like this, which I won't deal with at all explicitly. Let's just say that you can count them, and you'll count that s1 is 0, s2 is 3, and s3 is 0. In other words, you can find the characters. This calculation is very similar to the case of Lagrangian manifolds that we already did in detail. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time doing the linear algebra steps. We've done them once, and there are many more examples, including this one done in detail in the lecture notes. So uh, skipping over the linear algebra, we end up with the result that uh, we have s1 is 0, s2 is 3, s3 is 0, and we can calculate out also the integral elements, which we've written as some kind of expression like this about the gammas being certain multiples of the omegas, at least near the particular integral element we might want to work with, where the gammas are all 0, say. Um, this enables us then to calculate the dimension of the space of integral elements and check that this is involutive. We find involution, and so we find that the general solution depends on three functions of two variables. That's because s2 is 3. So we take the last non-zero one of these characters. We have characters s1 is 0, s2 is 3, s3 is 0. Because s3 is 0, it doesn't count as the last non-zero character. It's s2 that's the last non-zero character. It's 3, and so three functions of two variables. So that gives us a rather surprising result that there are a lot more um, triply orthogonal webs than I would have guessed. And uh, that's why we like exterior differential systems. It gives us these, uh, these nice, intuitive, straightforward computations that we can do using only linear algebra. It comes up with results that are sometimes surprising. And then we are left with the puzzle of how we would actually build these things by some more explicit techniques of maybe using, using differential equations. Very often, the way that exterior differential systems is used is uh, on paper in your office when you're writing a, 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 a piece of mathematics. But by the time you actually finish the writing, you've cleared away the exterior differential systems, almost like you're embarrassed of it. You try to do the calculation with using exterior differential systems. It gives you some intuition, some sense of what's happening here, three functions of two variables. And then if you're lucky, you can find a way to get rid of the use of exterior differential systems before you publish your paper. So this gives us a sense, though, that what we've been able to do, because we have these structure equations of Euclidean space, we can use them in writing out invariant differential systems. We can use them to calculate the polar equations of the invariant differential systems as well. And that means we can, for uh, invariant equations, uh, we can usually figure out how many functions of how many variables the various objects involve. Next time, we'll think about a more uh, effective way to calculate these things. I, in this example, embarrassingly, I didn't give you all the little details of the linear algebra. The next time, we'll actually do the details of all the linear algebra for triply orthogonal webs, because we'll have a better technique for handling linear algebra, um, for handling the linear algebra of calculating polar equations. And that technique will be called tableau.